This audio is what the Beacon Mic team truly believes represents good EQ practice and why I don't know what I'm talking about. Would you listen to this for a long amount of time? The Beacon Mic is a good product for everything except the microphone, and I'm dying on this hill. And at this point, I'm just convinced the people who work at Beacon, or at least the ones who make the decisions, or the specific one who handles most of the communication, don't actually know what they're talking about with audio. And I'm I'm done playing games with it. I'm Eples Vox, the stream professor. I have reviewed, tested, consulted with, experimented with, given feedback on, taken apart hundreds of microphones over my career. I don't have the most expertise or experience out there by any stretch. I have been learning as I go, but I've been doing this for over a decade. I've spent that entire decade learning the ins and outs of my voice, learning how they play with different microphones. I've worked with everything from $5, you know, knockoff, no name microphone capsules to $3,500 microphones and consulted, you know, tested. I've done a lot. I am always learning. And over the past month, I have continued to watch and rewatch hours upon hours upon hours of educational and course-based content when it comes to my vocal processing, EQ, things like that. Reviewing the comments I've gotten on my own audio processing mistakes over the years, and I don't think I'm wrong. I have spent the last month basically in a spiral of imposter syndrome because the tight-knit early tester beacon community and their representatives have seemed to just be entirely so focused on making the one microphone I have had a problem with in my entire career out as me not having any credibility or know what I'm talking about. And it has reached the point where I have finally accepted that that is not the case and I'm done. So consider this a beacon mic re-review of sorts. If you're interested in the overall features, the mixing features, things like that, go check out my other review. But this is going to be talking about the actual audio decisions that they make. The Beacon Mic is a USB dynamic microphone. It is supposedly supposed to target the Shure SM7B in terms of quality. We're going to have some demos here. I don't believe that to be the case. I was going to do this whole scripted video and make it like a half educational, half re-review thing. And I'm just kind of done talking about the microphone. I've basically completely burned my bridge, intentional or not with Beacon, and for any future products I cover from them, I will just review them independently, purchasing them when you are available to, because it is not worth dealing with the nonsense that some of the people over there put up. Everything from lying to my face about little things that don't even matter or affect them as a business, to completely gaslighting me for a very long time, to inconsistent messaging going all the way back to the GoXLR days. I'm just done. This is the microphone. This is how it sounds with very little post-processing applied at all. And we're going to we're gonna talk about these claims that I'm too harsh with my post-processing as well. So here we have, I have a basic, like this is literally the half of the settings are left at default. Tiny bit of boost to the highs, a little bit of cut here in this broadcast range, which we're going to talk more about. And then a tiny boost to the you know low end here with the subwoofer. I changed the style, but not the amount. I think it sounds fine. It doesn't sound amazing. It doesn't sound great. I still have that crunch. The crunch, the boxiness that I keep complaining about is still present in this microphone. And every single god dang time I try to tame it, it just destroys the audio. And that comes down to the audio decisions that this company has made. And between that and the inconsistent, contradictory, and completely wrong things Kicked Tripod has been tweeting lately about audio processing, I'm convinced that either they're so obsessed with their just like bro culture of this like tropey pod podcasty sound that they all think is cool and should be done, or they're just incompetent. And I don't like saying these things. I have, it is very rare that I will go this far with anyone. Like even companies who I've outright called their products scams or just completely torn to bits. I maintain fairly positive and pro professional relationships with. This has been impossible with Beacon. And I'm just going to leave it at that for now. So first and foremost, I'm going to go ahead and save my profile here. Save profile. We're going to rename it. Basic EQ. And then we're going to start over. So I'm going to jump over here to on device 10, which I guess is the same because the software is still buggy as hell and the profiles just do whatever the heck they want. The settings keep doing whatever they want. Software has still been a nightmare. So all the people who were in the Beacon Tester Discord who were like, I can't believe he said the software was unstable. He he knew he was testing pre-release software. That was the only software I had available and I have kept it continuously updated ever since release. It's still not in a good state. We're going to go in here because after an update, they introduced a couple presets. We've got no EQ, which of course is a completely flat curve. Although no EQ is completely misleading because the de-esser, bass enhance, and exciter are all still enabled. 
So this is not no EQ. This is still coloring your voice. But we got no EQ, which is false. And then we have low and high broadcast voice. Prepare your ears. Turn down your volume. If you're listening with an audio system with a subwoofer, get ready. This is what the low broadcast voice audio sounds like. And if you're anyone who's listened to my channel from like 2012 to 2016, you, you, which isn't most of you, but you know, I received a ton of comments complaining about this exact same audio style. This is Babby's first EQ curve. This is the equivalent to slapping an S curve in Photoshop on an image and being like, I know how to color grade a photo. This is like cranking up the contrast slider and claiming to be an expert at video color grading. This is bad practice especially for male voices, for lower end voices, cranking up the lows to, what is this? 4.2 dB, nearly 6 dB. This, by the way, everyone kept saying, be it the people in the Discord server or the allusions to it from the actual Beacon people, that my EQ was too harsh or either, you know, talking around that point whenever I try to claim that it's not. This is further than I took my EQ and then I, then I have taken my EQ in years in my career. This much low-end boost combined with their extra stupid subwoofer thing is bad practice. I'm gonna turn it off now. Actually, we're gonna check out high broadcast voice, which basically just moves the bass and muddiness range a little bit. So now we're here in high broadcast voice, which just kind of seems to move the bump a little bit further along in the frequency spectrum. I still consider this bad practice, but you do at least get less of the lower end boomy frequencies kind of emphasized, other than again, this whole subwoofer thing, the bass enhance. Uh, but Again, there's no high pass filter. There's no high cut. Th this is still really weird. So I'm going to set it back to no EQ so we can be a little bit more flat here. Although, again, there is still audio processing happening here. Now, the compressor by default, I have adjusted the threshold. The compressor by default is all the way down here, I believe, at minus 25, which is pretty insanely aggressive if you are talking at a competent volume and have your gain set correctly. And some of the levels, the attenuation doesn't always indicate that, but sometimes it does. Like right now we have 12 decibels of attenuation. The lower you set your threshold, the more aggressive a compressor is. And this is indicative of the entire problem, I think, with the audio profile that the Beacon people seem to think is acceptable. Let's take a time travel back to 2014 YouTube when Markiplier was dominating YouTube and had this incredibly boomy, podcasty kind of voice with the SM7B. It was kind of the big debut to YouTubers of that microphone. And everyone wanted to copy it for a little bit. And it became the de facto podcast and reaction YouTuber, or like, not reaction, like scary games YouTuber microphone trope for a while. Hello, my name is Markiplier, and welcome back to Sucker for Love. Chapter one is... And it was bad. Like, it it, it sounds impressive. This this kind of... what what kicked tripod is referring to as the California smile or something to do with tits, which is completely inappropriate curve, which I've only seen as referred to as the smiley face or maybe the mustache curve is not something that is considered like the way to go with EQing very much. It is very, as I'm alluded to before, it is Babby's first EQ curve. It is what my dad had when he had his graphic EQ on his giant surround, you know, speaker system rack of audio hardware, and he'd turn on that to help make the audio sound more punchy. That's all it is, is it makes things sound more punchy, like cranking up a contrast slider on a photo or video. Now, it's one of those things where if you get used to it for too long, when you try to turn it back down to normal, even though, you know, normal would be more accurate, it suddenly looks bad because you're used to things being skewed in so many different directions. It's not good practice and not having that high pass, you know, going on there, even though I believe the microphone still has some going, it's a bad idea. Now I say I believe because Beacon refuses to release the frequency response graph of this microphone, which basically no microphone company I have reviewed ha has done. They literally refuse to do it with the answer being given that they effectively they have too much magic happening behind the scenes for that to be relevant. I'm sorry, the raw audio of a microphone, the frequency response of the capsule and the actual physical microphone itself is not irrelevant because you slap some gimmicky software on there. This is where I really started to like all of this, the n hearing, you know, so many people in their little tester group echo that my EQ was too harsh. And every time I try to address it with the Beacon people, they just talk around it, followed by their presets being too harsh, followed by them refusing to release basic things and, you know, basic specs and calling my comparison of raw audio unfair. Yes, they literally said that it's unfair to show 
hang on. I, I want to get the exact wording here because every time I get like a single word wrong, that's all they talk about and they won't talk about the actual issue anymore. Okay, so when it comes to the frequency response graph, not at the moment. With Beacon Mike's signal chain and other some other stuff we've done, it doesn't really ap apply. This is not true. The frequency response of the microphone is the frequency response of the microphone. And this is contradicted by Kick Tripod's later statement when he's talking about his EQ fundamentals, which, by the way, was a subtweet of me, despite the fact that he said he can't subtweet me. Examples of just the gaslighting I have received, which this is literally the smallest level of it, but literally why lie about something like this? He later tweeted that none of, the, none of his EQ tips really matter if you don't know the frequency response of the mic you're EQing. Exactly! That's maybe why you should release it. Along with that... The, the statement about the raw microphone audio comparison, it's, I think reviews like that totally miss the mark, though, about why the microphone exists. When you create a microphone that has a signal chain, something that most products don't have, you want to give them the best capsule that can be utilized by the signal chain. Muffling the highs, while it may mean for better out-of-the-box sound, won't allow our microphone to sound its best when it's set up all the way correctly. We do need to get more presets in there ASAP. So that was both addressing the comparison of raw audio samples and the fact that they have a presence boost that makes my audio right now sound really bad and it's present in every single review even if different voices play to it differently and it's just mind-boggling that they think this way the way your microphone sounds out of box is the microphone you made it doesn't matter that you applied some other processing to it this processing isn't magic this processing can be recreated in any daw with any plugins or any existing parametric eq curve the only real magic is the specific exciter and bass enhance things that they use and again, you just got to get the right plug in and you can recreate it. This is uh, the raw audio is how the microphone sounds out of box. And that's only going to be amplified and, you know, emphasized by the post-processing in the suite, which is exactly what you saw in my review. So in my last video about figuring out what I did wrong with the Beacon mic, I showed you some examples of the other reviews and literally identified every problem I had with the sound in my review that was present in everyone else's review. I found some of the presence boost stuff in Knacker's review around the 2000 hertz range, which I had never encountered in another mic before, despite having reviewed a ton. I showcased that that was there because Knacker's had to cut it out, so I learned from that. I showcased that this dude, uh, Eagle Garrett, sounded just as crunchy and weirdly boxy as I did, which means it's not just me. He has a voice, you know, that resonates those frequencies. I identified that Harris, you know, along with most of the reviewers, had to eat the mic in order to really get good sound out of it, and I covered a couple other reviewers. Well, I've now come over here, and I am pulling up some EQ videos that I think are incredibly effective. All right, here's Joe Gilder. He runs the Home Studio Corner YouTube channel, and I'm pretty sure he's, like, I'm fairly certain he does a bunch of videos for PreSonus as well. In this video, he, he loves doing his illustrations, and it makes it a lot easier to break down. He breaks down the different EQ ranges. You've got the 50 hertz and lower, where you can add a little punch, but otherwise it's way too boomy most of the time, which is the case with their presets in the low broadcast vo pre voice preset here. That's that's way too much. So then I have to add a band. I have to come down here. Got to add high pass filter right there, which should be present all the time. That's kind of a basic. Then he's got the warm versus muddy in the 100 hertz range. And then he has full. When you're missing the frequencies here and they're not working right, or if there's too much of those frequencies, things can start to feel boxy. Almost like if you recorded something in a completely bare room with drywall everywhere and tile floors, there's a there's a resonance in like the 500 hertz range that just doesn't sound good. The sound of drywall. That's what happens when there's too much going on there. This is the 400 to 500 range I keep identifying over and over as being a problem with this microphone. And that's what I was attempting to cut out in my other video. So if you want to learn about EQ, again, Joe's channel has a ton of different videos about EQing for vocals, for music, for instruments, all sorts of stuff. And he breaks it down in a really just super helpful way. There's also another video from him over here about three vocal EQ rules. Uh, but in my experience, time and time again, mixing hundreds and hundreds of vocals, I found when I just go in and start boosting stuff, I generally make more problems for myself than when I first kind of find those frequencies that are misbehaving and tame them down a little bit. Then I can still maybe go boost the top end. A lot of times I might still need to do that. But after I've kind of tamed what's happening in the lows and the low mids and the mids. Make sense? I highlighted that excerpt for an important reason, because in my years and years of research from professionals, from looking into audiobooks, podcasts, radio, music, when it comes to EQ, the rule is cut first, boost later. 
You're supposed to cut out the gnarly frequencies and then maybe slightly boost the things you want to emphasize. Meanwhile, Kick Tripod is insisting that it's mic fundamentals to use this generic baby's first audio curve to boost the lows and the highs and maybe cut a little of the mid. This is not the case. This is not what you do with most microphones. Congested. I sometimes struggle with... Here's, here's another EQ video showing how to do it in a completely different program from someone who makes a lot of audio educational videos focusing on cutting before you boost. Because that's how EQ works. You tame the gnarly frequencies instead of trying to boost the other ones. And I think some of the problems I ran into is because of whatever else they supposedly have going on that they refuse to disclose or display a frequency response curve for. I was trying to tame the gnarly frequencies and whatever they're doing was basically counteracting everything I was trying to do. We're gonna pull out of this mode because that's just embarrassing. So before I get into the final step of just kind of addressing kind of what we need to do with the audio here to make it sound decent is the final statement from Kick Tripod. Actually, it's two statements here. One is the, I will say, if you saw any of the Twitter drama stuff, whatever, it doesn't matter. I was at certain points basically just be intentionally being an a-hole because at this point it was earned and deserved. But I did do some projecting of what the Beacon community kind of, kept saying or pushing the narrative that they were spinning onto Kick Tripod and the Beacon team because they were only ever talking around it. They never addressed specifics and they kind of, they didn't discourage it by any stretch. And in some ways, the ways that they worded things kind of encouraged it. But in one of his subtweets that were directly like, you can transparently, transparently look until I kicked him out of my Discord server, going back m months at this point, the, 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 the line of, Something about Beacon comes up in my server and he has a subtweet ready to go about how we're so wrong or about this generic advice and it, it was just a complete mess and I got tired of it. But one of the things he kept saying was that the range, so so one of, the, one of the points I kept bringing up is that the EQ curve I chose in my video wasn't harsh in the first place, if I go back here. Like this isn't a harsh EQ curve by any stretch of the imagination and the nine to minus nine dB of frequencies that the EQ curve allows you to do in the Beacon Processing Suite doesn't even allow you to get that harsh because I can't go past nine. And again, their presets are way more harsh than I do. Well, you had this whole subtweet ready to go about how they limit that range because if you need to go past that, then you're just doing something ridiculous, you're wrong. and. The, the whole team that works on Beacon now that worked on the GoXLR before has always had this the user is wrong kind of perspective and it drives me insane because that's never what a PR user sh or person should have. Regardless, my whole point was that they specifically limit what frequencies or what decibels you can control the frequencies at so that you can't go harsh. So I can't have a harsh EQ curve if they don't let you do it by design. That point seems to have been missed combined with the fact that he repeatedly says, because he tweeted that same thing multiple times, don't try to bend the mic to your will. I'm going to say right now, these kind of EQ curves, on top of whatever apparently existing like smile, mustache, frequency response the mic already has, is literally trying to bend the microphone in half to your will. This is bending the mic to your will more than anything I have ever done in EQ. All I did was I wanted a slight boost to the low end that I knew complemented my voice. I want a little bit of the highs kind of increased here. I wanted the nasals cut because I think that's important. And then I started identifying where this boxiness came in and was like, well, hey, I kind of want to cut that out because that kind of sucks. And I'm like, yo, let's get rid of some of that. Let's just try to cut some of that out. And then I started identifying all the other incompetent decisions that they made and suddenly I'm the one that doesn't know what I'm doing. As a quick demo, here's the same preset processing curve that they include with the Beacon mic software applied to a few different voices. So you can see it doesn't just sound bad on mine. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. Seven for the Dwarf Lords in the Hall of Stone. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. Seven for the Dwarf Lords in their Halls of Stone. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky, seven for the Dwarf Lords in their Halls of Stone. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. These audio samples were submitted by viewers on a wide variety of microphones. And while you will notice that it adds the boominess and the unpleasantness of the EQ curve itself, almost all of these examples are lacking the crunch or the back boxiness present in the Beacon mic 
despite other people's samples of the Beacon mic as I'm about to play, still having that crunch. And this is how it sounds completely flat out of the box with no EQ being applied and using proper mic technique to really bring out its full potential. I want to compare the SM7B versus the Beacon microphone completely unprocessed and then with the basically the exact same processing curve. And then I want to do it at a distance because right now I am one to two inches away from the microphone, which is fine. It's kind of been the standard for a little while, but a lot of people are moving away from that. As someone who is constantly watching what people want from microphones, more and more the trend is going to where people want the freedom to move around and they want to not have this big microphone in their face. It's been a demand that I have been trying to answer and solve for people for a few years now. It is a growing trend because this is, again, an RGB mic blocking half your face and sounding completely over compressed and boomy is a trope. They're trying to move away from that. The SM7B performs completely fine and sounds much more natural than it does up close and then this microphone does. So please tell me it's the same mic. Three rings for the oven kings under the sky. Three rings for the oven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for the mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. One for the Dark Lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. I want to address the EQ curve one more time here, okay? I want, I want to drive the final part home about why this EQ curve is so bad. So we're jumping back in here. I have tweaked it a little bit. We're going to jump back to the low and the high broadcast voices. Again, they are providing the same decibels of increase. So what you're doing is you're taking whatever the existing frequency response of the mic is. We can come down here. Blah, 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 blah. We've got a cut over here, it looks like, maybe a little bit of a, you know, uh, uh, falls off here. It falls off here a tiny bit, but it's confusing because of this damn bass enhance. There we go. All right. So here we have, like, a tiny bit of a fall off here, but it's not much. And then we have a little weird cut here and a fall off uh, on the highs. So this is theoretically what the frequency response of the mic looks like, but I don't have a scientifically accurate way to properly measure that. We're going to come back here over to no EQ. Oh, that's not going to let us turn this back on. Yeah, okay, so these settings aren't even affected by the EQ presets, which I think is a big mistake, honestly. All right, I'm going to leave it at this. I don't know if this is good. When you use a preset like this, this EQ takes the microphone, bends it in half, takes all of your low end, booms it up to a ridiculous level, like I'm literally, I'm going to go record this in my car because it's going to shake my windows. It takes your mids. Well, actually, your mids are over here. The nasally tones are over here. I don't, uh, it's taking out some of the box I will say, I appreciate that they're cutting here because I specifically identified this as the problem and they said I was wrong and now they're cutting it, but you don't lose the nasally. But basically, you're taking the mids, reducing them, you're taking the lows, bumping them up, and then you're taking the highs and bumping them up a little. And then you run it through the compressor, which again, their, their threshold is actually set really aggressive by default. I have it set to minus 20 now, but you take it through the compressor and what the compressor does is it literally takes the loudest parts of your signal and squishes it down. So you're boosting all this low end and then you're cutting all this mids. You're pushing the low end back down because that's going to be the loudest parts of the signal. As you can literally see in the software here, the loudest part of the graph is this low end. You're taking that, you're pushing it back down, and then you're using the makeup gain to bring it back up. So you're overemphasizing this, and then you're squishing the dynamic range back out of it. This is bad sound. This is a trope. If I set the threshold back to minus 25 like they had it, this is a sound that lacks all dynamic range, is going to cause complete ear fatigue, and, sa and just drive viewers away. I say this as a, as a creator who used nearly the exact same processing for a while and continuously drove viewers away. And I said, no, you're wrong. I know better because my experience, blah, 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 because I read somewhere that this was the EQ curve to go with because that's EQ fundamentals when it's not. This is lacking all dynamic range. It sounds completely unnatural and it causes ear fatigue. And when you're doing something long form, like a live stream, a podcast, whatever, ear fatigue is your number one priority. If you cause ear fatigue in your viewers, they cannot listen to you for any length, you know, for a significant length of time, and you're going to drive them away. Now, cheaper audio headphones are going to maybe make this sound better, but then you have a lot of headphones. Like, this is the cliche, like, Beats by Dre, old school, like, sound, where they're just like, we'll just put on a, or like the early Turtle Beach headsets, where they're just like, we'll just make it super loud and super punchy, and everyone's going to think it's higher quality when it's not. That's exactly what we're facing here. Oh, cool. Just clicking on the profiles at all. Doesn't switch settings anymore. <laughs>
Like, I, I've tried, I've tried giving this software a fair, a, I've tried giving this entire microphone a fair fight this entire time. Like, I have tried to be as fair as I could giving all of the BS, both from the company and from the, the, the microphone software itself. I've tried to be as fair as possible. And every step of the way, like, I cannot make up how ridiculous the things I have encountered has been. Like, holy hell. So final verdict on the Beacon microphone. The microphone itself is not good. It has terrible tuning. It's probably not a great capsule. I would question whether it's even, it might just be the same capsule as something like the AT2040. It sounds like they went with cheap hardware and put all of their R&D into the software because they knew that would be the selling point in the magic. And to be fair, they built an amazing processing suite. This is really cool. I, I, I bragged about it in the review. I won't question that here. It's really cool. I appreciate that they add all these labels for everything and they make it easy to mess with. They provide a lot of control to you and they identify it in the UX form, you know, in the UX ways as a, as a very awesome way to get the user to know what the heck they're talking about. But the hardware is questionable at best and the team behind it just makes the weirdest freaking decisions and that has gone back to the GoXLR days. So many strange decisions that... I, I assumed at various points I didn't know enough to know about and over the more they talk the more I'm convinced that they're just in their little like circle jerk you know echo chamber or whatever you want to call it of uh, they've got this weird bro culture where they're just like yeah this is what we want bros we want the punchy sound and the the RGB lights and the and 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 and, and the the Red Bull and it's this weird like Silicon Valley-ish like streamer bro culture of they're all buddy buddies. They left the big company because they thought they knew better. They made their own company and every single one of their audio decisions, I'm now calling into question because I don't think they know what they're talking about enough. There could be other people at the company that do, but the people I have interacted with, I seriously call into question. And I'm going to end this with a call out that is unfair to the person who I'm calling out. And so I'm going to say this right now that I mean nothing personal towards the person. After Kick Tripod told me he, it was impossible that he could subtweet me, he continued to directly subtweet me in the most transparent way possible, I guess, to prove some point. And after I made an entire thread identifying why the baked-in presets for the Beacon mic are cliche, tropey, and not good, he tweeted at one of the other Beacon staff members, Drixus, who is their, like, IT guy or something, and said, LOL, dude, your mic sounds bad, as a, like, haha, bro, look at this idiot saying you sound bad. So I went to Drixus' stream. So you're doing Amazon shopping? The wor It's kind of, like, best and worst about Steam reviews is that, yeah, like, there's 30,000 Steam reviews, but then there's also, shit, there's 30,000 Steam reviews, <laughs> and sometimes they're not good. It sounds bad. Like, not even trying to be mean. Like, it doesn't sound super egregious or horrible. Like, if he was clipping or, you know, got too much noise or something like that. But on top of the fact that he just barely talks in a stream in the first place, once I find mic samples, yes, it sounds completely overcompressed. It sounds choked, like, almost in a bottle or something. It sounds bad. On top of the fact that the audio balance is abysmal, the microphone audio quality in this stream sounds bad. So if they think that is a joking point to embarrass me by because they believe that it sounds great and this is a good example of how their microphone is and lol how dare this guy say it's wrong these people do not know what they're talking about with audio i just want to note since i didn't the first time i got no hard feelings against drixus I, i've barely interacted with them i'm not coming after them i'm just saying if you're going to use that as an example to make fun of me that is some terrible sounding audio like it's not again it's not offensive it doesn't sound like a lot of the really bad microphones but it doesn't sound good at all and it's not a good, haha, this guy thinks our mic sounds bad example, because it doesn't sound, it sounds bad. And I'm just going to end it on that. Like, this is the last I'm going to talk about this microphone, because I just, I can't do it anymore. I have reviewed, tested, whatever, hundreds of microphones at this point. This is the only one that I have this kind of weird back and forth relationship with. With all of my experience, take it or leave, you know, how much you think it actually is. With all of the microphones I have tested, if this is the problem, child then it only makes sense for me to think after, especially after spending the last month spiraling into imposter syndrome, being like, maybe I'm wrong by a bunch of people who mostly on average, not all of them, but on average have less credibility or experience than I do telling me I'm wrong without ever once giving me specifics. I have to assume that it's the one product I have a problem with. That's the problem because that's the rational solution to come to. Beacon have made a bad microphone with amazing software and assuming they release an audio interface at some point soon, given that's what everyone wanted from them for the GoXLR competitor in the first place, 
it will probably be incredible because you get to ignore all of their idiotic hardware decisions. And I mean, assuming they don't put any weird stuff in there. I, I feel like Beacon is a company that gets you 90% of the way there. And the last 10% is just the weirdest disagreeable decisions they could possibly make. But assuming they don't do anything too offensive with that last 10% on the interface, it's going to be pretty good. It's it's going to be a game changer. So I'm probably at this rate, it's almost a guarantee I'm going to have to buy it myself when it releases. We'll review it independently. That's fine. Got no problems with that. But this is not a company I can maintain a relationship with. And it's one of those things where like, I question whether you should either. And, and I can't make that call. And it's one of those things where I think the, the quality of the product, I think oversteps some of the community manager fallings. They also got rid of their community manager before they even launched. So it's just kick tripod kind of running everything. And he's, Already has a bad reputation for how he handles PR ever since the GoXLR days anyway. Maybe that's the problem. But from what I can observe, the audio decisions being made at this company are terrible. And they have too much of an echo chamber, especially since they created this. The, the, especially when a lot of what I have encountered over the past month that's kind of made my life hell or whatever isn't even directly from the company itself. But the, the toxic culture they've created through their testing group of taking what is... And I don't mean this to be insulting in any way, but what is on average a lot of creators who don't have a ton of experience working with companies on a direct level like this, who then get made to feel like they're, you know, part of the cool kids club, like they're invested in it. They're super stoked and hyped on it now. It turns into kind of a very toxic culture of they're going to be stoked on and excited for and happy with every decision made by the company. And they are then going to be super critical of anyone who doesn't agree with those things. And I have seen that firsthand and secondhand firsthand in that a few of them have just turned into full on reply guys that I've had to block on multiple platforms because they basically just attempt to tell everyone that my review is horrible about X, Y, or Z every time it comes up, even though they are not in the conversation. But I've also seen it from other testers who were critical of the decisions made or even who just suggested feedback and were either just given excuses of why they aren't going to work on it right now instead of like, oh, that's a good idea. We'll take it into consideration. They're, they make up a bunch of excuses why they can't do it. Make up data about having a bunch of DMs of people saying they're wrong, telling a woman that she, she doesn't know what she's talking about and is wrong about a feature and then telling a man that he's correct about it. That was awful. I don't want to get into the details of that, but... Uh, they denied the presence boost that I called out at first and then we're like, well, we, we're just not going to get rid of it just because Epos doesn't like it when they specifically told someone it didn't exist. They created this toxic culture of people who are just turning into an echo chamber where they're just going to hype up everything Beacon does rather than providing actual useful feedback. And a lot of this comes from like they wanted people with not a lot of experience to test it. That way the reviewers could be separated. And I was invited to be one of the testers. I didn't want to do it because I don't have the time to fight with this buggy ass software and deal with the feedback back and forth. Like I just want them to make a product and me to review it. And so I said no to it. I kind of regret it because then they let their testers make reviews to where their testers had six months of experience, whereas I had days but they created this toxic culture where they just kind of create a bunch of people who are going to come yell at me for my stance on things meanwhile they're you know out there I, I i don't know it's just been a mess i'm done talking about it i'm done supporting this company i'm gonna review things fairly and independently and assuming there isn't anything crazy with whatever interface they come up with i'll review it appropriately there but i i i can't imagine buying paying 269 dollars for a microphone that sounds bad just to have this if other options aren't available to you. There's VSTs, like the R Reaper EQ VSTs will, and the compressor and stuff will make you sound just as good as this processing suite can. The, the, you, you can buy channel strips like the DVX-286S that I don't consider super great. Like they're, they're kind of noisy, the 286S specifically for the higher gain microphones, but with a cloud lifter or a fat head or something can get you pretty great there without needing their buggy software that doesn't work upon launch like this is a hardware solution like there are other options the io24 has a wonderful dsp that i've enjoyed a lot better than the beacon software there are other options so i can't imagine paying nearly 300 dollars for a microphone that sounds bad out of box and a company that can't have a serious conversation about these audio things i have tried time and time again and i've specifically requested myself that they release the frequency response graph but i've tried time and time again to have a conversation about how this microphone sounds and be serious about it and they are literally incapable. So I'm done. If somehow this is what my entire reputation gets staked on, then whatever. But I'm dying on the Beacon Hill. It's the one microphone I've had this big of a problem with out of all the ones I've reviewed. And the next 50 microphones I review, I've even been working on other reviews. The next 50 microphones I review won't be the same kind of situation.